Okay, first things first. DDR5 came out and was expensive. And for the most part, didn't really give us anything over DDR4 in terms of performance. And for those who have been tinkering with PCs for a while, this was the case when DDR4 launched and DDR3 and DDR... You get the idea. It's only recently that instead of bog standard slower 4800 megahertz kits being the only ones available, we're now starting to see faster kits around 6200 megahertz. And that's only going to increase even further as the platform matures. So today I'm taking a look at a 4800 megahertz kit. Wait, didn't I just say? Keep going, this is special. Apparently this kit is special and can do super fast speeds, but for a lot less money. And it's made by Sabrin. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Yep, face the camera, face the camera. Yep, that's that it. power supply, so dreamy. Oh my God, it's the Antec signature. With a fully modular design, 80 plus titanium efficiency rating and 10 year warranty, it will be the most famous power supply you've ever owned. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. So Sabrin, that's a name you'll be familiar with as they literally shook up the NVMe storage world with blistering fast speeds for affordable prices. On top of that, they've also been pushing the boundaries of high speed drives with large capacities. And that's why we've seen super fast NVMe drives in eight terabyte capacities. And uh, word on the street is that 16 terabyte drives are coming from them in the very near future. I think it's safe to say other storage manufacturers are kind of feeling like Sabrin are a bit like a thorn in their side. So what better thing to do than to move on to memory and start shaking things up there as well. So what have we actually got here? Well, from a first glance, you'll see some memory modules that essentially look like much larger NVMe drives as they've tried to keep the branding on point to match their already well-established products that have been doing so well in the market. Now, one key thing you'll notice though is that they don't actually include heat spreaders, which while I guess is fine for running at stock, what if we want to overclock them? Surely that is gonna restrict us and lead to instability. And what has this all got to do with not buying faster memory anyway? Well, Sabrent believe that through their own research and using highly overclockable ICs from SK Hynix that you don't need to spend extra money on faster 6200 megahertz memory with XMP baked into it. It's all just extra cost. With this, just install, set it to auto and away you go. But realistically, how far can that actually take you? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. And to do so, the first thing we needed to do was see what stock performance was actually like and how that compares against these faster and more expensive kits. We needed to see if the juice was worth the squeeze. And that involved installing them in our DDR5 memory test bench, consisting of a MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR5 motherboard and Intel i9-12900K processor and seeing what they could really do. Starting with a simple throughput test, ADA64 showed that the kit performed right on track with other similar 4800 megahertz kits from the likes of Asgard and SK Hynix. Performance fell slightly behind the faster kits from Corsair, Gale, and of course, that 6200 megahertz kit from Viper that we're comparing it against. When it comes to latency, again, being a test that focuses purely on speed and speed alone, the numbers are very indicative of what we'd expect, but it's good to see that the Sabrent Rocket memory is performing in line with other kits with the same speed. As we move over to Cinebench R23, we actually see the Sabrent Rocket kit come out on top, though it's well documented that Cinebench doesn't have a huge RAM scaling influence. But again, it's good to see the memory line up with where we'd expect it to be and can more be looked at as being an accurate score for stock performance. Moving over to SuperPi, and again, we see scores in line with other similar kits. We can clearly see the effect that the faster memory from Patriot Viper has by shaving off around 17 seconds from our calculation time. Again, for consistency, looking at W Prime, we can see the Sabrent kit performing perfectly in line with the other kits we tested against. In Corona, we had a bit of a mixed bag of results where it clearly shows larger capacity makes a difference, but speed, not so much when looking at how things compare to the 6200 megahertz Venom kit. In 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra, the Venom kit leads the pack showing that speed does make a small difference. And our Sabrent kit actually sits above all the other faster kits. Maybe the 40, 40, 40, 77 timings are having more of an effect in this benchmark than pure speed or capacity. 
Moving on to Time Spy Extreme, and in this test it had no real cohesion to the results, with the slower kits and the fastest kit all performing relatively about the same. So let's take a look at gaming, and this is where speed and unadulterated bandwidth really comes into play, as we see all three of the 4800MHz kits performing identically. As the speed of the memory modules increase, we see the FPS do the same. As we move over to Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, we see the capacity being king with the 64GB SK Hynix kit, followed by a small bump in performance on the faster kit, while the slower kits fall in line slightly behind it. Lastly, Dirt 5, and again, capacity is king, but beyond that, seems speed makes hardly any difference, as we actually see the fastest kit performing worse, and again, could see the imbalance of speed versus tighter timings having a bigger role to play. Okay, so performance isn't groundbreaking, but it's where we expected it to be. Luckily, having quite a few kits to compare to definitely allows us to see any anomalies if they decide to show themselves. But now that we have our baseline figures, we can start pushing things to see, firstly, how far we can go in terms of overclocking, and secondly, what kind of effect it has on performance, which is what we love here, free performance. So to start with, when it comes to overclocking, there's many different ways to skin a cat, whether that be striving for the highest frequency or the tightest timings, or a kind of mixture of both or whether you're happy to pump more voltage through the modules, or if you're wanting to keep it stock. We decided long ago that we didn't want any sacrifices to be made in terms of gaining frequency, but losing out by slacking in timings or generating more heat. So that's why when we overclock memory, we decide to keep the timings and the voltage manually set in at their default stock values. So that's exactly what we did. Once dialed in, we looked at simply increasing the frequency up to the next level and then testing for stability. Once we were happy with kind of what we were able to get, we could then move on to the next level and simply repeat. Now, while we are sometimes able to boot at a certain frequency, unless we personally see it as 100% stable, then in my opinion, it's just not good enough for us. We could boot into Windows, but if it's not stable after that, it's just not stable. And that's where we ended up settling a whopping 6200 megahertz. We did actually manage to boot at 6400 megahertz and we were even able to test using ADA64 to see how memory throughput was affected. But other tests showed some instability and the system rebooted. That wasn't good enough for us. Now, if you really wanted to, I guess, tweak things a little further, then you could go back to what I said. You could boost the voltage or you could slacken the timings or do a mixture of both. But for us, an increase of 1400 megahertz overall, well, that was more than enough. But how does this compare to its stock performance? And that's where my favorite saying comes in again. Was the juice worth the squeeze? Well, straight away, it's clear to see that in our retest, that's definitely the case, with an amazing 29.9% uplift in performance. Write speeds saw a similar performance boost by around 24%, and copy speeds the same with a 27% performance increase. In terms of latency, this was also decreased from 86 nanoseconds to 66, putting it at the same as the more expensive 6200 MHz Viper Gaming Venom kit. In terms of the general memory throughput, the read, write, and copy speeds were ever so slightly under the Viper Gaming kit. So performance was again in line with where we expected it to be. But what about gaming? That's the key important thing. That's why people are buying super fast memory to get the very best gaming performance. And it was actually clear to see from our stock test that in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, frequency was everything. And that was evident in our overclock too. Once we were up and running at 6200 MHz, the FPS shot up from the stock 219 up to 229 frames per second. Okay, so it's only a 4.5% uplift, but it's free performance for memory that costs you less in the first place. How much less, I hear you ask? Well, for comparison, the Patriot Viper 6200 MHz Venom kit that we compared against and have a full review over on eTechnics.com of currently comes in at $378.99 on Newegg plus shipping and taxes and about $399 on Amazon. Now, if you're in the UK, the only place to buy it right now is on Newegg for £375.59p. So, quite expensive, but that's DDR5 for you. In terms of pricing on the Sabrent, 
we have no concrete pricing yet. But if we judge Sabrent on their storage products and how aggressively priced they were in the market and seeing similar DDR5 4800 megahertz rated kits from Kingston, Corsair and Crucial, they're all coming in closer to the $200 mark or £240. So we're able to see kind of straight away, there's a huge, I mean huge saving to be made over a 6200 megahertz stock kit. And for a kit that can hit the same speeds and the same performance figures, why would you buy anything different? I mean, RGB, I guess. I mean, if you think that that is worth almost double the price just to have RGB, your head needs a wobble. What do you think? Are Sabrent onto something here? Do you think they're gonna sort of do as I said, you know, disrupt the memory market just like they did with storage? As I always say, when something like this happens, the only winner throughout everything is gonna be you guys, the consumer. More choice, lower prices, what's not to love? And on that note, hopefully you loved this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you appreciate the amount of work that goes into our videos, then supporting us through Patreon would be absolutely fantastic. We have a whole host of goodies, including behind the scenes content, access to performance charts, exclusive giveaways, game night, and so much more. It's definitely worth doing. And on that note, I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.